excited about this panel. First off, sort of by introducing myself, my name is Brianne Garrett. I am a Forbes reporter and the editorial lead of our Forbes of Culture community. And I'm thrilled today to be moderating a panel about an extremely important topic, which is how to you know, authentically attract and retain customers. And I'm joined by my wonderful panelists. I'll let them introduce themselves. Um, all right, let's start with Amanda. Uh, good afternoon. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Amanda Baldwin. I'm the CEO of Supergoop. Uh, Supergoop is the first and only lifestyle brand 100% dedicated to UV protection, aka SPF. So look forward to hopefully convincing everyone by the end of this that um, you should be wearing sunscreen every single day. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Amanda. Dana, we'll go to you next. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Um, my name is Dana Hill Robinson. I'm the founder and CEO of Coco Teak. Uh, Coco Teak is a beauty box subscription company for women of color. And we are all about reminding women to um, put themselves first and to be the best versions of themselves. Thanks, Dana. Maya? Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for having me. My name is Maya Gupta. I'm the Senior Director of Operations at Noticed. Uh, we're an agency that work with change makers and disruptors um, in the health and wellness space. Um, we mainly uh, specialize in e-commerce development and retention marketing. Thanks, Maya. And last but not least, Nicole. Hi, hi everyone. Um, my name is Nicole. I am the Partnerships Manager at Gorgeous. Um, I manage the entire East Coast, and we are a customer service tool um, that aggregates all your support in one place. Think email, chat, Facebook, phone, Instagram, all in one place to help you have a seamless customer experience. I'm super excited to be here and part of this conversation. Well, thank you all. Thrilled to be joining you on this conversation. I want to get right into it and start off with a really important topic, which is social responsibility. You know, consumers are increasingly weighing in social responsibility um, into the decision making of, of who they choose to support, why they choose to support a brand. How are you as brands and brand leaders um, prioritizing your social responsibility? Um, Nicole, we can start with you. Yeah, I think um, for us and, and because we aren't 100% um, a brand and since we are more of a software, um, we're always kind of looking for brands and finding ways um, to work together. Um, and I think probably one of the other brands could probably answer that a little bit better um, just because it's more aligned with, with what they do. But um, yeah, I think, you know, as a software, we're always looking to find initiatives that we can sponsor ourselves as a company overall. Yeah, Amanda, do you want to answer? Sure. Um, you know, it's a great question and obviously very near and dear to our hearts at Supergoop because we were a brand that was created as a mission, um, was almost a nonprofit. Uh, many people don't know the origin story of Supergoop, um, and it's a wonderful one. And, you know, our founder was a teacher and a harpist who had a friend who was diagnosed with skin cancer at a young age, and Holly set out to actually eradicate skin cancer. So, social responsibility and, and purpose are at the heart and soul of everything that we do every day. It's not necessarily always front and center of our marketing. We often say, we, you know, if you wanna create change, you wanna, um, you wanna create a category, you have to do that by being, being fun um, and lighthearted about it. But we have a very serious purpose at the heart of what we do um, that is really about creating SPF formulas that can be used by every single person on this planet. Um, and that they'll actually enjoy doing it. So really that's what gets us up in the morning. That's what motivates our team. That's what's kept us going through the, everything that the last year has thrown at all of us. So for us, it, it is our reason for being. Um, and it's the reason that we make every decision that we do. And, and you know, it's actually an incredible gift to be given as somebody in my shoes, because a lot of decisions become, the tough ones become a little easier um, when you know why you're, um, why you're doing what you're doing every day, so. Big thing for us, for sure. Yeah, thank you for that honest answer. Dana, what about you? What are, how are you factoring in um, social responsibility with Coco Teak? Sure, um, well, you know, a huge, huge part of our ethos is uh, self-care and, and, and taking care of others. And one of the things that we focused on specifically during the pandemic was providing boxes to uh, those frontline workers. Um, also just reaching out to you know, our subscribers who may be a frontline worker and sending out gift boxes to them or to their family members. Um, it's important for us to, you know, just to make sure that we um, put social 
uh, social responsibility into the forefront. Thanks for that. Maya, I wanna, I wanna pivot to you. You know, you're in a unique situation. You're partnering with brands all the time. How are you factoring in social responsibility when determining who you're partnering with as well? Uh, that's a great question. Um, to, I'll backtrack a little bit to your first question. And I think part of what we do at Notice is we think about the internal customer and the external customer. Um, the internal customer is who works for us. Um, we are a vastly diverse agency. Uh, we're 60% female led um, or run, I should say. Um, and then, so we, we need, really need to listen to what our employees, uh, what, what makes them tick, what's important to them. And we try to make sure that we work with brands that represent that as well. Um, in our um, qualification processes where we were really have, um, taking a deeper look and we're really having to make some adjustments. So making sure that we're speaking um, to brands that are actually doing what we um, say we do, uh, which is disrupting the industry. So um, do you as a brand have a mission? And what is that mission? Um, how do you identify with that mission? How do you measure that mission? Um, and what are you doing um, to make a difference in the world? So um, it, we started out kind of being like, we only want to do these types of missions. And I really don't think you can narrow it down. You really, in order to encourage people to make a difference um, and really um, empower communities, you need to kind of open, open that uh, gate up and make, make sure that you're just focusing that, okay, you're doing something to make a change. Um, and so that, uh, us as a brand, we really want to make, or I guess a brand as the agency, but us as an agency, we wanna make sure we're supporting uh, those brands in those missions. And then also to take it a step further, um, we're a retention marketing agency. We wanna make sure that we're highlighting that when we speak to um, our brand's clients. Uh, hope that answers your question. Oh, it answers it great. And, and thank you, because this idea of being mission-driven is very interesting in these times, right? Like having a local impact, uh, especially in the midst of the pandemic. So having to sort of adjust your mission-driven strategies is really important right now. Um, so thank you for, for bringing that up. Uh, when we talk about sort of strategies, and you mentioned something else, Maya, which is sort of effective retention, um, where do the priorities lie um, in, in where you go, how you go about as, as leaders of these brands um, retaining customers? Amanda, I want to start with you because obviously at the heart of your uh, company is a really effective product that you put a lot of sort of pride into. So tell me about how that helps is, it, you know, sort of a means of, of effective retention. Yeah, I think that I'm a big believer that the best retention strategy you can have is to create a product that people want to come back to. So um, I think that, you know, that's not to take away from the value of amazing emails and text messages and great customer service. And we, we pride ourselves on those things as well. But if you don't have a product that people, and especially something that you're using up and, and you need to come back to repurchase, that's what really has people stick with the brand. Um, I think I saw something in the chat about love for super group. So thank you for that. Um, and, you know, I think it really, that's what drives us is, is sort of figuring out how to create a product that somebody is going to say, you know, I wasn't so sure about SPF, but then I found this particular product and everybody seems to have one. It's not the same answer for everybody. This changed my behavior. Now, daily SPF is part of my routine, is part of my health and wellness. This is a choice that, that I'm making and I'm going to stick with. Um, so for us, that's, you know, that's really first and foremost. I do also believe that brand storytelling and, and emotion does play into this. It's not a purely, um, you know, product benefit discussion. Um, and, but I, and I think it's when you really have both that you, you create real magic. So I think people do fall in love with brands. They do have relationships with brands. Um, and that goes from everything from how the package looks um, to what you might think of a Instagram feed to the social responsibility that a brand has. Like those are very, very important too. But I think they, they can't stand on their own if the product isn't fantastic. Thank you for that. Nicole, let's pivot to you. So obviously with a tech-driven company, retention and sort of personalization can often be a challenge. How are you aiming to sort of personalize and, and story, add storytelling elements into how you are retaining customers? Yeah, you picked on me at the right time. I actually wanted to chime in here because Supergoop is one of our longstanding customers. I'm super close with Christine. She's a gorgeous power user. Um, and the, the idea behind retention is really around having, yes, an amazing product, but also good customer experience and being able to turn those negative experiences into a positive one. And that's what you can have with the power of 
good customer service. I think us at Gorgeous as a technology, we also have to create an amazing product and be product forward so that we can retain our customers. Um, I think it goes, you know, every one of us has someone we have to report to. And in order to keep them happy, we have to provide them service as well. Um, so that's kind of how we think about customer service and, and retention as a whole, because if you think about yourself eating at a restaurant and you have terrible service, probably not going to want to go back to that restaurant. I always like to use that example. Um, that's how you can really retain someone. Um, if, if you do wow them with that experience and the way that we do it with our tools, we often recommend to brands is, is, you know, being there, you know, this last year in the, in, in the pandemic, when we lost a lot of that physical engagement is, you know, being their skincare consultant, driving personalization of through chat or through Instagram or responding in a tone that actually feels more like a friend. Um, that's how you can retain customers because oftentimes they want to connect with not just the product, but actually the brand behind the product. Um, so that's what we mean by personalization is using elements um, behind the customer service um, team to actually train them more to be like a, a salesperson um, that you're actually engaging with in real life. Um, and then on top of that, we also can personalize it with, you know, we know their order information, we know what they previously purchased, we know their name, um, having all that information in front of you allows you to actually manage that customer experience from the beginning to the end, um, especially if you're engaging with them on chat or email or they wrote in, um, you know, something about a product, you know, always offering discounts when possible. I think that, you know, that pleasant experience really allows for the customer to actually make space and, and want to actually budget to come back. Thank you for that. Uh, Dana, what about you? So, so I know that you, uh, data is a big tool when it comes to identifying what your customers want. How are you merging that with storytelling um, and also sort of prioritizing the value of relationships? How does that all sort of combine to help your retention strategy? Sure. Um, well, one of the big things that we do, um, again, you know, going back to what Amanda said, and it's about, you know, creating a, a product that, you know, your customer wants, customer wants to come back to. So one of the things that we find very, very helpful is surveying our subscribers. Um, so we do a very, very in-depth survey every month. We want to find out what products they liked, you know, will they buy them, which is huge for us because um, one of the things, you know, with our brands, we want to make sure that they're getting a return on their investment um, in participating in our box. So we want to make sure that you know, we're finding out, are they going to purchase the product once they've tried it um, in our box? So um, we take those insights um, and, you know, we really look at these insights to better uh, create an experience for our subscribers um, to want them to come back uh, to Coco Cheek and resubscribe. Um, the other thing that's important is customer service. Um, I want to touch upon that because, you know, a lot of times, you know, it's that personal um, touch point that you have with a subscriber that you can, you know, basically build that relationship with them um, via, you know, answering the, the questions, you know, uh, you know, within, you know, we want to say within 24 hours, um, but just making sure that, you know, your customer can um, trust you to, uh, um, you know, have that open and honest communication with them. Um, for us, that's been really key in retaining our subscribers. Uh, another thing that was huge for us was, you know, we had an issue where, you know, especially when you're subscribing to um, and you're buying something, you want that to get it right away. One of the issues that we had was the way our uh, back end was set up, a customer was subscribed, but then they would be charged before their first subscription ar arrived. So that was a huge pain point for us. So that was one of the things that we put in place um, and it changed our retention. Uh, it was an amazing difference in terms of, you know, the customers that were canceling, we, we our retention levels uh, decreased and we were able to retain a huge amount of subscribers just from that one thing. So, you know, again, it's, it's about customer service um, it's also about the customer experience as well. Thank you for all that insight. So we talked about a lot. We talked about, you know, marketing and customer, effective customer service, data, storytelling, uh, building relationships. Maya, take us home. Is there anything else in sort of effective retention or maybe just you're echoing some of the other points from these other ladies? Um, what has worked really well for you? Thanks for putting me at the end to tie it all together. I like it. Um, I think one theme that I've heard from each one of our talented speakers is 
um, you may not have said it directly, but is personality. So how does your brand come across? Um, Amanda, you, you stated it perfectly that it's not just that the email is not just the SMS, it's, it's the whole picture. So um, the way to tie it together is what does your website look like? Is it speaking your personality? Are you, are you taking into, um, into account all of that data that shows how your customer is shopping? Are they shopping on your, on their phone? Are they shopping through email or are they checking out your product? Maybe you have a wholesale relationship and they're checking it out in the store. Are you giving them that ability to see all that information and who you are? Are you talking about your mission there? The, the other side of it is how do you tie that all together? That personality, um, your direct, most direct communication is your one-to-one -one communication through SMS and email. So you have a direct um, spot in someone's home. So let's get them the right message. Um, let's look at those drip campaigns. Great, you can send a welcome email. You can send a, you can send a, you forgot this in your cart email, but what is the more personal email? Who is speaking to your customer? Is it, could it be a, um, a text-based email that's coming from your CEO that's thanking you for purchasing that product? Could it be um, some sort of, um, also, we were finding great um, response rates with those text-based emails. Could it be a text-based email that's um, just reminding someone, um, hey, it's, uh, it's my CEO or it's the founder here reminding you that we've released a new product. We haven't heard from you in a while. We'd love for you to come back and check our check out our product and remind you. Um, those are the, the additional, you know, there's the baseline um, drip campaigns that, that, that everybody has, but those are the additional touch points that really, I, I believe, set our clients apart from uh, just the everyday, thank you for shopping or welcome to the list, here's a 10% discount. It's those little extra elements. And then the other element that I wanted to tie in was is recognizing the personality of your customers by actually segmenting and mining your list and making sure that you're not sending um, an email out to everybody. Um, the health of your list depends on that and the deliverability of your email depends on that. So if you're just sending it to everybody, um, your client's going to get mad. They're not going to like your personality anymore and they're just going to um, unsubscribe and possibly move on to another product. So um, yeah, that's my, that's my tie in there. Just make sure how are you speaking to that personality of your brand? I love that. Add personality right in there um, on the list of effective retention strategies. Um, so I want to segue into, you know, something that can often be hard to talk about, right? Uh, failures or not necessarily failures, but challenges, trial and error experiences that can often be sort of the most uh, effective learning experiences for brands. So I would love it if each of you can kind of walk me through, walk us through an example of sort of a trial and error moment, more you know, uh, emphasis on the error moment of, um, you know, on the customer front, was there a time that you um, executed something that maybe didn't go as well as you hoped, but you learned a lesson from it? I'd love to hear, hear your thoughts on that. Whoever wants to start, because I know this is a, this is a difficult thing to, I can to, kind of I can start. start. Oh, go for it. Actually, go for it. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> so, well, um, so we had an issue where um, we were shipping our, getting ready to ship our box, but, and we received the products to our warehouse, but they were damaged. And I mean, all of them were damaged. We could not ship the products to our subscribers. And like, literally we were supposed to be shipping, you know, within the next, you know, three, four days. Turned out the supplier had to, there was an issue with their production. So they had to send a whole new set, which basically made, we were late maybe about two to three weeks in shipping our box, which is huge in the subscription business, subscription, subscription box business. Um, you know, but I was open and honest with our subscribers, sent an email, you know, basically explaining what happened and was able to circumvent what could have been a huge backlash just by being open and honest and just showing that we're human. Um, you know, these things happen. It wasn't something that happens on an, it hadn't happened ever in the past. And it turned out to be, you know, we, we were able to mitigate any, um, you know, backlash from the subscribers and it turned out fine and we were late, but, you know, we did ship and we ship when we did ship, they loved the products and we got through it. So I think, again, it's just going back to just being open and honest and not trying to hide behind a veil and just showing that you're human. And I think that goes a long way in, in, in building, you know, authenticity and trust, you know, with your customers. And again, the retention as well. Of course. Yeah, I, I want to go and I want to go along with that because I was actually going to use an example similar to that with one of our other brands who their warehouse was on fire or something crazy like that and they were 
oh, so panicking. But I think, you know, what we also worked with them alongside is actually doing proactive communication, how you just mentioned perfectly is, is being proactive versus reactive, letting it happen and letting all the customer inquiries come in. So like, for example, we had them lift or put a chat up on their website that says, hey guys, if you're reaching out about this delay, this is what's happening right now. No need to reach out. We've got it covered. And those are little wins where the customer's like, oh great, they're already answering my question. I don't have to think about it. I don't have to follow up. They've got it handled so that you're proactively managing expectations before you even have to receive a tons of inbound about this problem and then potentially losing customers. Um, same thing goes for another brand. They were having tons of returns based on shoe size. We told them to launch a chat that says, hey, we recommend you ordering a size up um, or, or, or these shoes run half a size bigger or smaller. And that drastically mitigated the amount of returns they were getting. And it was really just using your customer data, also understanding what's happening logistically um, to be proactive with the customer and keep those touch points strong um, to really make sure that you can deliver a successful customer experience so that you can still continue to retain and, and turn that failure around. I can jump in. Examples. Oh, oh, sorry. Go no, you go ahead, Amanda. Go. So, um, that's all you I think, thank you. I think that what, you know, all these examples really highlight is that, that the data never lies um, and that the consumer is, is always right. Um, and, you know, I think that that seems sort of basic, but I think, you know, we have many a story where we're launch a product and, you know, something isn't quite right. Um, probably the best one that, or, you know, the hardest one is we have a setting powder that when the first packaging didn't function the way it needed to, and we're now on iteration number three, we finally got it right. Um, and, you know, we could tell within days um, that it wasn't quite right by just reading reviews and seeing, and, you know, hearing from what cus comes from customer care. So I think, you know, especially as you scale as a business, really, um, there's nothing I love more than sort of hearing what, um, what people are saying and really paying attention to that. And I think um, it's really great in the macro when you see the, the data and, and the statistics. And then it's also in some of the qualitative things of just kind of getting in there and, and reading. And, and I think all of us are definitely speaking to the best thing you can do um, when something goes wrong is be really open and honest about it and deal with it head on and, and not hope it goes away. Um, because if it's a real problem, it, you know, you'll, you'll need to deal with it and sort of faster and with honesty and, and transparency, I think is always, always the way to go. To jump on to what Amanda said, um, honesty is what we've seen always works the best. Um, we're all human and mistakes happen. Um, we've seen some of the most lucrative email campaigns actually come from um, those mistake emails. It's the little hidden secret. Um, I guess I just told everybody. But uh, the, the thing to remember, though, is if you see those email campaigns come through, um, there's been a lot of thought and, and talk about that and how, um, how it's affecting the customer uh, internally at the brand, the customer externally um, that is shopping the brand. And um, yeah, those have some, been some of the most lucrative campaigns, but it's also then what do you do after that? What do you do after you send out that mistake um, campaign, the whoopsie email. Um, are you changing what happened? Are you, uh, uh, as Amanda mentioned, changing something about the product? Are you addressing how you communicate with the customer? So it's how do you follow through? And I think that also has been a theme through our, our conversation today. How do you how do you walk the walk and talk the talk? Thank you for that. Um, so I want to end on a pretty actionable note. So for, for you know, budding founders who are tuning in and are unsure of where to start on the customer front, what's one tip, one piece of advice that you would say in terms of how, you know, someone who's trying to scale their business and attract customers, one piece of advice that you have for them on the customer front? I can start. Um, I would probably say um, to scale your business, like have a good success team in place. Um, that doesn't mean you have to hire tons of people. That means having the right technologies in place to help you do a lot of the heavy lifting, you know, like using automation, for example, in our tool, you can actually minimize a lot of those repetitive inquiries, for example. Um, but also just focusing on, you know, quick response time. I think everyone agrees here and, you know, responding quickly, efficiently, um, pers in a personalized manner is super key because you can actually drive further retention and conversion through that. Um, and so I would say, you know, being customer first, feeling 
however you'd like to be treated as a customer is probably the right way that you should be delivering as well. Um, so check out what your competitors are doing, check out what some of your favorite brands are doing and really benchmark yourself against that. I agree. Um, having a, a great customer service team is essential to um, retention as well as uh, social proof. So gathering testimonials, reviews, and having those on your website, um, that social proof, that, that fear of missing out is going to help to retain and bring on new subscribers as well, or new customers as well. And to add on to that, it's um, attention to detail. Uh, so many people, when you're starting out with a brand, um, got a great product, but you wanna do all the things. Um, kind of zero in and do the things that you're best at. So if you're not really that great at email, work with someone who's great with email. If you're not, um, you're not sure which direction to go with your packaging, reach out to, to someone in the community about packaging. Um, don't reinvent the wheel. Just start with it. Start with attention to detail and start small on, on, on where you, what you do best. I'm not sure I can top any of that, um, but what I what I would say is, you know, and I'm I'm not our founder, but one thing that I have learned from her is stay true to yourself, never give up. It's not it does not happen overnight. I think that um, sometimes it can look like that from the outside that it was all smooth sailing and happened really quickly. Um, that never seems to be the case. Um, it's always a little bit bumpy, um, and it's a roller coaster. And stay true to yourself. And I have deep, deep admiration for those who kind of get out there and start businesses and, and then figure out when, when a partner can be helpful. And, and I think that, you know, figuring out what you're great at and then figuring out where you can build a team around you, I think is the other thing to really think about. I love this. Thank you so much, ladies. We have a little bit of time left. So I really want to end on a note, you know, that's dear to my heart. I think at the, at the heart of all of your companies, there's a mission. Um, and so, you know, in very short words, so we can get to all of you in these last two minutes, what does that mean to you? What does it mean to be a mission-driven company? Um, you know, in your own words, what does that what does that mean to you? Um, I can jump in. What, what that means to me is, um, what are you what are you trying to do to make a difference? And whatever whatever size it is, just do it. Commit to it. Have integrity behind it. Um, I once had a um, mentors say, just be unreasonable about it. Do that, just be unreasonable, do it. Um, whatever you need to do to figure out to get it done, um, you're gonna do it. Yeah, I think our philosophy is turning your customer service center into a profit center. That's what we live by. And we wanna help small merchants to big merchants really turn that around and have the ability to create exceptional support at the smallest level that, you know, some some bigger companies are doing and following in their footsteps. So um, I'm excited. I love, you know, helping. And I think, you know, being at a company like ours, we love being able to be a tool that is actually like a help center um, as well. Really true. We love Porter's guys been great. Um, you know, what I would say is when people ask me, what does success look like? I never have a number. Um, it's not a sales figure. It's not a profit figure. Um, it's when I know that skin cancer will be not one in five of us, but will be hopefully one in 10 to one in 20. You know, you have some other answer to the question um, of what's the point of your business um, and that you're really clear on that. So that's what it means for us. And take us home. Sure. Well, our mission has always been about helping women of color find the best in beauty and self-care um, for their skin, for our skin tones and hair textures. And that's the core of who we are. And uh, that's what we strive to do every day. Well, thank you ladies so, so much. This has been an extremely candid, authentic conversation. I look forward to seeing you as you continue to drive that mission home within your brands. Um, and yeah, I appreciate you taking the time to speak with me today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.